This morning I want to talk about the state of the church and where we are as a church family and really uh, encourage us to look back over the last year with a sense of gratitude and thanksgiving. And so I really want to put that thought, that encouragement in your heart this morning, that gratitude and thanksgiving. That's really the main thing I want us to focus on this morning. You know, Barry and I went to uh, San Antonio together for a few days this summer to reconnect. Uh, San Antonio is kind of our home away from home when we're trying to get away for a few days. And uh, so many times we've been there over the years that we joke that we know downtown San Antonio better than we know downtown Austin. Our oldest son, Cade, and his girlfriend, Sailor, came to visit us Uh, while we were down there in San Antonio, and we reminded him that when he was a young kid, we had taken him to San Antonio to see the Alamo. Because as all of you know, or if you're new to Texas, you should know, uh, that you're not a real Texan until you've gone to the Alamo. Can I get an amen? Amen. He said, "Uh, you never took me to the Alamo. I said, we took you to the Alamo. He said, no, you, you, you told us about the Alamo. You took us to the IMAX to see the movie about the Alamo, but you never took us to the Alamo. I said, we took you to the Alamo. He said, I'm pretty sure you didn't. I said, I'm pretty sure we did. And I said, well, we're going to fix this right now. Either way, we're going to go to the Alamo. And so we walked a few blocks over there, and I said, you've got to see it. Sailor got to see it and everything. And I, I said, because, you know, the state motto of Texas, I don't know if this is what the state motto is, but it should be, is remember the Alamo. Y'all, you are, you always say it. Why do we uh, use that phrase, remember the Alamo? You know, our nation's full of museums and landmarks, national places of historic significance that are protected, preserved, that we go visit, we look at, we tour, we read, because of this reality, that remembering the past is a really important part of preserving the future. Let me say that again. Remembering the past is a really important part of planning and preserving the future. In the Old Testament, God tells the people of Israel to remember over and over and over again. He warns them. He says to them, when Deuteronomy 6, when they get into the land, he says, when you get in there and you prosper, you build vineyards and houses and things start to go really, really well, he warns them with this phrase, do not forget the Lord. Because it's a real danger, isn't it? We just keep going, life is happening, we're thinking about the future, our plans, our strategies for the future, and we forget who God is, and we forget what he has done. And because of that, it's important to just understand that in the Old Testament, the the Lord told his people, you've got to remember. The Hebrew word is zakar. Uh, When I was in seminary, I was kind of fascinated by this word, and so I did my master's thesis just on this one word, zakar, to remember, to memorialize. Uh, In fact, in the Old Testament, God gave his people festivals, celebrations, things that they had to do every year to remember. I mean, they're, they're having the Passover every year. This is like getting, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years away from the event of God delivering the people of Israel from slavery in Egypt, and yet he told them, have the Passover, do it every year so that you don't forget what I did when I delivered you from slavery in Egypt, and you will always remember who I am and what I did. Unless you think this is an Old Testament idea, Jesus gave us a meal that we are to celebrate together every month. We do it monthly. Here we call communion. And Jesus says, every time you take that meal together, do it in remembrance of me. Don't ever forget. When we take communion, what are we remembering? We're remembering the cross. Don't ever forget what Jesus did when he hung on the cross and he died for you. Why would we need to do that? Because we are a forgetful people and we just move on to the next thing. (laughs) And so God says to us, don't forget, be a people who remember. And I just have to tell you guys, honestly, as your pastor, this is a struggle for me. I am a person who likes to think forward into the future. I'm a person who likes to plan for the future. I'm a natural problem solver. I like to look at like what's broken and how do we fix it. Like, you understand? That's how I'm wired. And yet God says, hey, before you get to all that, please listen to me. Some of y'all need to hear this. Before you get to all that, take time and look back and remember. Remember God's faithfulness 
remember his goodness? Some of you, it's been a very long time since you sat down and you wrote out a list of things you're grateful for. It's been a long time since you sat down and you wrote out a list of what God has done, his goodness and his faithfulness. And when you don't have that rhythm and habit in your life, what happens? You get full of worry and anxiety. Hey, I'm the same way. I get stressed out. I forget how good God is, how big and faithful he is. And so I have to go back and I have to remember, remember. Today I'm bringing this message to you because it's a good time for us to look back and remember all that God has done for us and in us. Here's a phrase I want you to hold on to this morning. We must look back with gratitude so that we can look forward with faith. Write that sentence down. I think it's really important. We have to look back with gratitude so that we can look forward with faith. In other words, the more we look back and remember what God's done and we give thanks to him for it, the more our faith will be strong in the future of what God's calling us to. Now, next week, August 11th, I'm going to bring all the future. (laughs) I'm going to bring all the vision. Where are we going? What's the goal for the next year? Talk about courageous faith, what God's calling us to in this next year. I'm very excited about all that. But I felt like the Lord this summer was like slowing me down. Hey, before you jump into the future, take a little bit of time and lead the people to give me thanks and praise him for his faithfulness and goodness in the past. And I don't know about you guys, but for me, the, one of the reasons this is so important is because um, when bad things happen, you know, loss, grief, trials, difficulties, challenges, when bad things happen, that's like all I can see. Anybody else like that? It's just like there could be all these good things happening around me, but this one bad thing is like all I can see. And so the other thing I want to just encourage you about this morning is, is just for today, take your eyes off that challenge, take your eyes off that heartache for a second, and look up and say, wow, look at all that God has done, okay? Let's try to do that together this morning. Let's stand together and read First Chronicles. If you've got your Bibles, let's stand together. We like to stand here at City View in honor of reading God's Word. Um, just to remind us that this is the the Lord's word to us that we're hearing and responding to. Uh, First Chronicles 29, starting in verse 10. This is David's prayer to the Lord. And he is looking back. And he's also praying for his son Solomon, who's about to undertake the construction of the temple. So that's kind of the context we're jumping into. First Chronicles 29 and verse 10. Then David blessed the Lord in the sight of all of the assembly. David said, May you be blessed, Lord God of our father Israel, from eternity to eternity. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the splendor and the majesty. For everything in the heavens and on earth belongs to you. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom, and you are exalted as head over all. Riches and honor come from you, and you are the ruler of everything. Power and might are in your hand, and it is in your hand to make great and give strength to all. Now, therefore, our God, we give you thanks. And praise your glorious name. But who am I? This is a great question. Listen to this. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? For everything comes from you and we have given you only what comes from your hand. For we are aliens and temporary residents in your presence as were all of our ancestors. Our days on earth are like a shadow without hope. Lord, our God, all this wealth that we've provided for building you a house for your holy name comes from your hand. Everything belongs to you. I know, my God, that you test the heart and that you are pleased with what is right. I have willingly given all these things with an upright heart, and now I have seen your people who are present here giving joyfully and willingly to you. Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, our ancestors, keep this desire forever in the thoughts of the hearts of your people and confirm their hearts toward you. 
Now give my son Solomon an undivided heart. What a great prayer. Give my son Solomon an undivided heart to keep and to carry out all your commands, your decrees, and your statutes, and to build the building for which I have made provision. Then David said to the whole assembly, Blessed be the Lord your God. So the whole assembly praised the Lord God of their ancestors. They knelt low. They paid homage to the Lord and to the king. The following day, they offered sacrifices to the Lord and burnt offerings to the Lord, a thousand bulls, a thousand rams, and a thousand lambs, along with their drink offerings and sacrifices in abundance for all Israel. And they ate and they drank with great joy in the Lord's presence that day. Lord, thank you for your word. I pray that that same spirit great, just great joy would fall on your people this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for standing. As we look back over the last year, um, I want to grab a few words out of this text to walk us through. Uh, I think it's important that we praise, that we remind one another, that we give thanks and we commit. So this is kind of the outline of what I want to walk us through. We praise, we remind one another, we give thanks, and we commit. Let's start with praising God. Uh, David, as he's at the end of his life, and he has basically taken up this offering, he's given up his own resources, he set up his son Solomon, because he wanted to build the temple, but the Lord told him no. He said, there's too much blood on your hands, David. It's your son Solomon that's going to build it. And so David gives willingly, sacrificially, and he sets up all the pieces for Solomon. And then at the end of his life here in First Chronicles, he praises the Lord for God's goodness. And so I just want to say to us, as we look back over the last year, it's very, very important that we praise God for his unchanging, unparalleled greatness. His unchanging, unparalleled greatness. Now, I don't know what you've been through in the last year, Probably some highs, probably some lows, maybe some great moments, maybe some real difficulty and heartache. I know you've been through change. (laughs) Everybody experiences change. But here's what I want to remind you. God remains the same. God remains the same. David had been through all kind of adventures in his life with God. He had been through some serious high points as he was a shepherd boy that God brought all the way up to the kingdom and the kingship. I'm excited this fall to preach the life of David and what we can learn about a life of faith from looking at King David's life. But David also had some serious low points. He had some moments of doubt, of sin, of rebellion against God, of loss. And here's what he's saying at the end of his life. In the midst of all of that, the ups and the downs, I praise you, God, that there is no one like you. I praise you, God, even though I'm the king, you're the real king. Even though people come and they bring me praise and they admire me and they bring offerings to me, I want to acknowledge, this is David's words, that you are the one that has all splendor and majesty and glory and power. Amen? And so it's important for us that no matter what you've been through, that you keep your eyes focused on God. As we look back over the last year, we want to make sure that we come from this place of honoring God in praise and honoring God in prayer. These two behaviors have to stay at the core of our rhythm as a church. This is why we have a worship team. This is why we have a worship ministry, to make sure that when we gather together, we are being encouraged to lift our eyes to God and to praise him. Because no matter what you've been through this week, God is still God. You need to be reminded that he's God and you need to praise him. So I don't feel like praising him. That's the time when you most need to praise him. Very, very important. But also we need to seek God in prayer. I just love that we have such a dynamic prayer ministry. Our elder chairman, Sylvester, right now leads our prayer ministry. We have a group that meets at 8 a.m. to pray for all of us before we even get here. Come on, church. We got a group that, different group that prays at 9 a.m. while we're in worship. We have a different group that prays at 11 a.m. that's praying right now while we're in church. We we just really believe because, listen, we could have great plans and strategies and budgets and all this stuff, but if God's power and presence are not with us, what are we doing? What are we doing? And so all of that 
it's just a reminder. We've got to keep our eyes focused on God. This is where David is at the end of his life. He's focused on God. And I want us as a church family just to stay there. God is the anchor, the foundation of our church. And so prayer and praise have to be essential ongoing behaviors. I want to publicly praise God before you for his faithfulness. I want to thank God that through the ups and downs of church life, the ups and downs of my own family life, the ups and downs of my own struggles, God has, whoo, God has always been faithful. I know sometimes God feels distanced, distant to you. He sometimes feels distant to me. Sometimes God maybe seems indifferent to what you're going through. But can I encourage you to slow down and stop and look back and just remember how faithful he's been to you, how good he's been to you, way more than you deserve. As I get older, I believe Psalm 37, 25 with more and more confidence. You remember Psalm 37, 25? It says, I have been old, I have been young, and now I am old, yet I have not seen the righteous abandoned. Amen. So we praise the Lord together. Make sure that's number one. As you look back over the last year, praise him. Number two, as we look back over the last year, let's remind each other that God is securely on his throne. This is related to point one, but a little different. Okay. <laughs> King David, who was literally on the throne, says to the Lord, you are the one who is always on the throne. You are the one who has given me everything that I have. So David is saying, if I have a throne, if I have a kingdom, if I have a kingship, it's because you, God, are the true king and you've given it to me. And he's reminding all of his people who were there that God is securely on the throne. When we look back over the last year, we have to remind one another that God is still on the throne. Most of us face and have faced Unexpected challenges over the last year, some of them beyond our control, some of them self-inflicted, let's be honest, okay? We have experienced death in our church family. That's one of the hardest parts of doing church life together. But I would remind you, in the midst of death, God is still on the throne. He numbers our days, he secures our eternal destiny, and so we remind one another, even in the face of death, God's on the throne. We've experienced increasing political turmoil and conflict over the last year. Feels like it's heating up right now, right? (laughs) Getting ready for the election this fall. I took time back in January to preach five weeks, kingdom politics. What does God's word say about government and politics and voting? And probably most important, relating to people who disagree with you. Come on, church. And in the midst of that, I want to remind you what I said repeatedly in the spring and that you need to hear, and I'm, Lord willing, I'll say it to you a lot this fall. Whoever wins the election, whatever happens to our government, God is still on the throne. Amen? Amen. Amen. So we have to remind each other of that. We've navigated financial ups and downs in the last year. Maybe you've been feeling some of the inflation like I have. But we trust that even in financial hardship or challenges, Or in my family, four teenage drivers, Lord help. God is still on the throne. I want to thank all of you when I'm just talking about finances for a minute. Um, I just want to thank you for being a generous church. Um, I could give testimonies for a long time, but just faithfully giving to City View and all the things we support, but also just giving to each other and meeting needs in the church family. And that's just so powerful and encouraging for me as a pastor to see that. So I just want to say thanks. We've experienced uh, massive cultural changes around us. It feels like sometimes it's just cha- things are changing so fast. Again, let me remind you, whatever happens in the culture, God is still on the throne. You see how important this is? And so as you look back and you think, man, that felt disorienting and that was a challenge and that was hard, whatever. Let's just keep reminding one another, hey, God's sovereign. He's in control. He's still on the throne. So we praise the Lord for all that he's done. We make sure and remind each other that he's still on the throne. And then third, David says in this prayer, I love it in verse 13, after he praises God and he reminds himself God's on the throne, 13, he says, now therefore, so this is really important, therefore what? You know, therefore pushes us back. 
Because God has everything, everything comes from God, because God is on the throne, therefore, he says, we give you thanks. Don't miss this. When you center your heart on who God is, the behavior that should flow out of that is the practice of gratitude. So you need to look at everything in your life. And I know you're like me. Well, I've got this house and I've got this family and I've got my health and these things because of me. Wrong. You have that house and you have your family and you have those relationships and you have your health because of God's kindness to you. And so because of that, if you believe that, then you should take time to give thanks. I want to give thanks this morning for some things personally and collectively. And I'll just go quick through this stuff. Okay, you might want to write down a few things if something stands out to you just to remember what I said. But other than that, here's really the challenge. I'm going to give you my list of what I'm thankful for from the last year. But I want to encourage you this week to make your list. You with me? This is the application. I'm I'm giving the application early. (laughs) After all this, I want you to make sure you take time, you look back in the last year, and you give God thanks and praise for all he's done in your life. Don't miss anything. Take time to do this. I want to first of all just say how grateful I am for this place. What did we do to deserve to live here? Nothing. 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 I'm so grateful to God that I live here and I'm raising my family in this Round Rock, greater Round Rock area. It's so awesome to be in a community that's growing, that people are moving to, that has a vibrant economy, that's safe, that has a unified big C church. I could do a whole sermon there, but I won't just for sake of time. But that is not a small, small deal. The fact that the big C church loves and supports each other. That has strong civic leaders that we have relationships with. All that just to say, man, what a blessing to be in this area. Not only that, but I'm thankful for this land and this building. Uh, If you're new to City View, uh, we moved into this facility back in 2017. And we bought this 20 acres of land that are on this corner. And there was nothing out here at that point back in 2017. We built this 34,000 square foot facility that allowed us to grow our ministry, but also gave us room to expand in the future. Remember that. So many churches right now are struggling to find affordable space to meet in. As I said before about inflation, the cost of rent, buying land, construction have all literally doubled in the last five years. If you haven't been in the commercial space at all, it's crazy. And so I want to publicly thank God for this place. We use this building every day of the week. There is so much ministry going on here, it's crazy. And so God, thank you for blessing us with this place to meet and the ability to expand. I also just wanna thank God when I'm thinking about this place that the nations are coming here. I'm so praising God as I look at the city of Round Rock, whether it's because I'm out at the Little League fields or I'm going to Walmart and, uh, or I'm you know in my neighborhood or I'm at the school with my kids. What, what do I see when I look around? I see literally people from all over the world yeah. here in our community. Diversity of ages, ethnicities, backgrounds, people not just moving here from all over the country, which is true, but also people moving here from all over the world. What an amazing opportunity, church family, that we have to share Jesus with the nations in our own community. This is one of the reasons it's so important for us to create such a welcoming environment for all people. You've heard me say we want to be a church that is a multi-ethnic, intergenerational congregation. We want to be a church where people from all different backgrounds and nationalities feel like they're at home. And also we want to be a congregation people of all ages feel like this is their home and they can be here. We want to be a church for every man, woman. And child. So I'm really just grateful for this place. I want to say that publicly. I'm grateful for this church family, the people. What did we do to deserve the blessings of this community of believers? I'm really sincerely grateful for all of you. I'm grateful for our elders and our staff. 
I want to publicly honor our elders who pray over us, they care for us, they guide us. The Bible is very clear and commands us that we are to show honor for our elders who labor to care for us and who also, the Bible says this, will give an account to God for their leadership of the local church. That's what the scripture says. So I want to thank God for our elders. I want to make sure all of you know, they meet every week, they pray over us, they're involved in ministry, they're serving faithfully, they're doing all this stuff, and they don't get compensated. I just want to make sure you know that. I want, to, I want you to know that when they encourage you to get involved in ministry, they're just asking you to do what they're already doing. They're saying, follow me as I follow Christ. So I'm thankful for our elders. I'm thankful for our staff who work really hard to lead and disciple us, to serve us, to walk with us during the hard times, who show up at the, you know, at the hospital when we're having a difficult moment or show up and help us with our children when we don't know how to parent, who run all these effective programs in our church for children and students, and they provide environments for all of us to make friends and grow spiritually. And I'm just really thankful for our staff. Our staff's made huge strides in the last year when it comes to our staff health and our unity. And I especially wanna call out and thank our two executive pastors, Andrew Yee and Rick Perales, who have worked tirelessly over the last two years to manage our team and manage the hiring process for our church. And that's not a small, small deal. So I just wanna thank them publicly and I'm really honored to get to serve with our elders and our staff. But I'm also just wanting to say to you, our elders in church cannot run this. Our elders and staff cannot run this church. It's too big. You know what I said earlier about going to three services? Hey, we need all hands on deck. The reason I'm saying that is because I have to be honest with you. Our elders and staff support you guys, but you guys run the ministries. That's honestly the way this church operates, okay? We are able to serve so many people and love on so many people and help so many people here and around the world because we have the most incredible volunteers. From City View Kids to student ministry, to worship and production, to all of our recovery ministries going on, to our marriage ministries. None of this would happen except for our ministry leaders. Not only that, but I gotta call out our life group leaders. I'm in a life group. My life group leader cares for me. <laughs> I know how important that is. Life group leaders are huge. They're the backbone of our congregation, providing care and community and discipleship and service opportunities. And over this last year, we've expanded to 45 life groups and we're gonna expand to more because everybody needs to be in community. And I just wanna thank our life group leaders because they do so much ministry. You know how many things I hear about and then what I hear after that is, oh, the life group already took care of it? I hear that so many times. I just want to praise God for our life group leaders. And one other ministry that you guys never hardly see unless all of a sudden it shows up in your life is our deacons. Shout out publicly to our 15 deacons. You know we have 15 deacons in this church? And shout out publicly to Michelle Weber, who is the coordinator of the deacon ministry. And she is a force of nature, if you've not met her. Small lady who's a force of nature. And our deacons do so much to help with congregational care, meals, practical needs, transportation, supporting senior adults, caring for new moms. What a ministry. So all that to just say, I'm just really, really thankful for our ministry leaders and our deacons. I'm thankful for our global missionaries. Do you guys know that our church supports 20 missionary partners around the world? This last fiscal year, this current year that we're in, we will give away $83,000 as a church to support our missionaries, missionaries around the world. We sent 11 mission trips to serve globally, uh, encourage our partners. And in fact, this morning while I'm preaching, there's a team in Ghana, Africa on a mission trip right now. Uh, over the last year, we got to support earthquake victims in Turkey, help with constructing a school in Malaysia, support a conference for Muslim background believers in Europe, supported church planning programs in South Asia and Central Europe. What a blessing to be able to support God's work all over the world. Uh, this is a side note here, but you need to be a global Christian. I know we love America and America is important but there's a lot of Christians that don't live in America and so you need to be a global Christian. And one of the applications of that is you need a passport. This is one of the other applications, okay? He said, write down a gratitude list. Second, make sure your passport is not outdated. Why? Because when God taps you on the shoulder to go, you don't wanna go, I can't, I don't have a passport. Just get the passport so you're ready. <laughs> Amen, all right, that's free. Uh, let's see. 
Uh, really grateful for our local partners. We support uh, 10 local nonprofit ministries that are reaching our community. Do you know we had over 300 of our church members serve during Love the Rock, that service day back in October? That's amazing. Many of you signed up to give blood, uh, help with our food drive, donate money to Agape, provide back to school supplies for Round Rock ISD teachers and students. Uh, it's just a joy to live in a city with great local nonprofit partners. I'm thankful to God for our association partners. You know, we planted our 40th and 41st churches this year as a movement. We hired our newest church planting resident, Nate Barron, over here. Shout out, Nate. All right. We also, in addition to Nate, we had three other church planting residents uh, start this summer across our association. So God's doing a great way work in church planting. Listen, all this is really cool. Um, but when I think about being grateful for people, uh, I'm really most, most grateful. Whew. I'm most grateful for our City View members, our faithful members. We completed eight Discovery, Discovery City View sessions over the past year. I already said this. We had over 150 people move from newcomer to member this year. It's one of the reasons we got to move to three <laughs> services in September. We have the most wonderful people in our church family. Barry and I have been leading this congregation through many different seasons over the last 17 years. Y'all know this September will be our 17th anniversary as a church. And we can say in all honesty, even though we've had hard moments and challenges, we've constantly been amazed by the love and the grace and the kindness, the faithfulness, the generosity of the members of this church. Barry says all the time, even if I wasn't a pastor, she would go to church here <laughs> because she loves y'all so much. So to all of our members, we're really thankful for you. All right, I had to get over that emotion. Gratitude for people, gratitude for the place, gratitude for opportunities. We got huge opportunities that God has planted us here that we get to, you know guys know how many young people are in this community? Uh, when I look around the community and I just, put my lens on for a minute. One of the things I'm really grateful for is that this community is full of kids and students, that God's given us the opportunity to reach the next generation for Christ. Um, I think God's heart, if I'm reading the New Testament correctly, the heart of Jesus is really for children, young people. Um, we have about 200, 250 kids every week in City View Kids Ministry. We had 375 kids during kids clubs here on campus. We had 60 preteens go to preteen camp. We had 105 youth go to Epic. We had our Rad Week serving special needs children and their family, which is a whole other cool ministry I could talk about for a long time. I'm just so excited that God's given us this opportunity to see children and youth come to faith in Christ. We've baptized over the last year dozens of kids and students this ministry year. Praise God for what he's doing in the next generation. I'm thankful for the opportunity that even though there's challenges in our community, there are ministries that we have that can meet those challenges. There are really specific spiritual needs across our city. Of course, the greatest spiritual need is lostness, that people don't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And so we have the opportunity to point people to life in Jesus Christ. People in our community have relational pain and isolation. They need friendship and community. The church has so much to offer here. You're alone, you're isolated, you're disconnected. We get this whole community of people that wanna to get to know you. We have so many people in our city that are struggling with addiction. Severe addiction, destructive habits that are tearing their life apart. And we have a ministry in regeneration that can help people find freedom in Jesus Christ. People have family struggles. Marriage and parenting is hard. We've seen a lot of couples get divorced. But we have re-engage, we have merge, we have these ministries to come along marriages and to help them. We have a community that doesn't know the Bible. Biblical illiteracy is a huge spiritual need. But we have men's ministry and women's ministry to help people get into the word and learn the Bible and find friends and be in community. Listen, I'm just want to give God thanks that he's given us people that are passionate about these ministries that can meet needs in our community that are really powerful and important. Finally, I just want to thank God that he's given us the opportunity to meet physical needs in our city. I already mentioned a few things before that you guys have supported us in, whether that is giving food to the serving center or helping provide supplies for some of our other partners or the school district. But I just want to mention here real quick one of the things that's been eye-opening for me this year. Um, this will kind of tee up where I'm going next week, but uh, you guys know that some of the community 
programs that fund food, clothing, supplies, and housing for vulnerable children, that some of that federal funding is going away. Some of that was COVID-related. That's kind of drying up now. And there's an opportunity for us as a church and a big C church to make sure that we're paying attention to where the needs are for children in our community that are at risk. And it's really important. It's close to the heart of God. And I'll share more about that next week. Also, I just want to give a shout out because our online ministry is really exploded this year. <laughs> our growth across, across all of our platforms has grown like 200%. And I just really want to thank Ken's for his hard work of making sure that we're staying connected because everybody is online. I'm grateful for this place. I'm grateful for the people. I'm grateful for the opportunities. But I'm finally, I'm, I'm grateful for God's grace. Um, my favorite sentence in this passage I said to you is verse 14, when David says, who am I, who are my people that we're able to give like we are? Uh, This is actually an echo of another verse in 1 Chronicles 16 where David says, who am I, and it's actually more personal, who is my family that you've brought us this far? I was in my quiet time this summer in Kings and Chronicles, and I ran across that verse. And you know, sometimes you read a verse, sometimes you do your quiet time, and it's like, I'm not getting anything out of this. And sometimes you read a passage, and it's like a lightning bolt comes out of heaven, where God's like, this is the verse, like pay attention to this one. That's what happened to me in 1 Chronicles 16, 12, where it was that question from King David, who am I and who is my family that you have brought me this far? Because you know, sometimes in ministry, sometimes in life, we like to throw ourselves a little pity party. Come on, church, I'm gonna get in your business for a second. We like to throw ourselves a little pity party. Why is everybody so mean to me? Why people betray me? Why people hurt me? Whatever, right? And we play ourselves, and sometimes we really are the victim of people who really hurt us. But you have to be very careful because once you get that narrative in your head, you can really start to see yourself as a victim and everybody else are the people that do wrong and you don't do anything wrong. And the key in that verse is David understands he's not been a perfect king. David understands he's done some things wrong and he has sinned and he's made mistakes and it's hurt his family, it's hurt the nation of Israel. And so he is at the place where he is in a spiritual journey when he can ask the question, honestly, who am I and who is my family, God, that you brought us this far? Because everything that King David sees, he says, this is by grace. I don't deserve any of this. And that's the way, I feel like the Lord just had to say that to me this summer, to remind me, not just salvation, what Michael talked about earlier, of course salvation is by grace. Everything is by grace. Everything you have in your life is by grace. Everything you have is a gift undeserved. You gotta get that down to the core of your being so you can answer that question, who am I? And who are we that we've been blessed this much? The last few years of ministry have been hard, as you've heard. It's been hard not just in church, but in many professions, trying to figure out post-COVID and how to respond to all that. And then we had a season here at the church where we had a lot of staff turnover, and that was a hard season. And I just want to publicly own that in front of all of you, because ultimately the buck stops with me as the lead pastor, right? And so I've made mistakes. I've done things wrong. I need to own it with you guys. I've learned from those things. I continue to try to grow as a person and as a man, as a leader. Listen, why am I telling you that? Because I look across this church family and and the growth and the health and the things that God's doing and it's a reminder to me, listen to me, I don't deserve any of this. Is that where you are in your life? Have you remembered that everything that you have is a gift undeserved? It's a gift of grace? That if God gave us what we deserved, none of us would be here? But God has been merciful to us. He's been kind to us. He has poured out grace on us. It's so important for us to remember that. And so I wanna say with David, I am so grateful for grace. As I wrap up the sermon, what are you grateful for? You need to make a gratitude list for yourself in addition to making sure your passport is up to date. (laughs) You need a gratitude list. As we move forward into the future, two things to not forget from this year. First of all, don't forget the essentials. Our whole goal this year was focus on the essentials 
your daily time with God, being in community, open and honest in your confession, coming to worship, being faithful in your giving. All the basics, right? That's all the stuff we build on for the future. You can't build on and leave the essentials behind. If we try to grow and expand as a church and start new ministries and do new outreaches and we stop spending time with God every day, we're in trouble. So don't forget the essentials. If you get so busy and active this year and you get so involved in ministry and you lose the essentials, something's out of whack. So stop, slow down, and go, okay, how do I get those essentials to make sure that they're there, they're in place, okay? Don't forget the essentials, but also, number two, take time to express your gratitude and experience great joy in giving God thanks. I love the end of this passage where it says, after all their time that they had together, there was eating and drinking with great joy in the Lord's presence. That's my prayer for you. You're gonna go have lunch after church today. You're gonna eat and drink May you do it with great joy while you're having lunch, expressing gratitude for God's goodness in the last year. Amen? Make sure you do it.